we, uh, we're very happy to have our hostage back. The whole Princeton University uh, community is very thrilled. And it was a one-on-one -on -one hostage swap. And we are very, uh, actually, I think it was a great thing for Iran. I think it was great to show that we can do something. It might have been a, uh, a precursor as to what can be done. That was U.S. President Donald Trump speaking to the press on 7th of December. Welcome to Newswire. I'm Aiza Umar. And that's essentially what we will be looking at, whether the U.S.-Iran relationship is finally on the mend. Now, this prisoner swap took place with the help of the Swedes and an American uh, Princeton, Un Princeton University grad student, Zhu Wang, was conducting research in Iran when he was arrested there in August 2016. He was charged with espionage and sentenced to 10 years in prison, something that the United United States officials have continuously denied the allegations by Iran that he was a spy. Now, in exchange for Mr. Wang's release, the United States freed Mr. Masoud Soleimani, an Iranian scientist who was arrested at the Chicago airport last year, and he was convicted on charges of violating American trade sanctions against Iran. Now, the U.S. Justice Department has pretty much dropped all charges against Mr. Soleimani. In fact, American officials say that it was a low price to pay for Mr. Wang because Mr. Soleimani was expected to be released from prison next month under a plea agreement. Now, Mr. Trump here says, as you heard, that this is a great thing for Iran. But really, is it? And can uh, it, as he says, this be a precursor to as what can be done moving forward, especially on the JCPOA? Meanwhile, talks held on Friday between the European signatories to the Iran deal and Iran went ahead without sanctions being imposed on the Middle Eastern country as Iran continues its efforts to roll back from the JCPOA terms and conditions. Now, the Europeans could have triggered a mechanism in the accord that could renew UN sanctions against Iran, but it didn't. What all was discussed, and, and is, has this started off uh, the road to reconciliation for Iran and the U.S. This and more coming up in the show. Let me introduce who we have today with us. We have uh, our guest, Mr. Mustafa Khushchev, an analyst, joining us from Tehran. And we have Guy Burton, a Middle East expert, joining us from Brussels today. Welcome to both of you. Let me start with you, Mr. Khushchev. Do you agree with Mr. Trump that this is a great thing for Iran? Hello, and thanks for having me. Well, no, not at all. As a matter of fact, as you just mentioned in your uh, package, in your report, or, uh, Dr. Soleimani was uh, more like a hostage in the U.S. He was not charged with any kind of crime. I mean, he'd never stood trial, a fair trial, or any kind of trial, actually. And he was taken hostage in there. He had never violated any sanctions rules. Uh, what he did was taking a number of vials uh, from the U.S. to Iran, which were never under sanctions. Iran is a pioneering state in area of uh, stem cell technology that he uh, is one of, uh, I mean, Dr. Soleimani is one of the renowned experts and world scientists in this field. And everyone knows that he was invited to the U.S. in order to run a project that's cooperation on an uh, equal footing, I mean, uh, when you consider the level of Iran and the United States. So it was not like taking a centrifuge machine or some enriched materials uh, or uranium from the United States to Iran. So basically, the, uh, he was arrested most because he could be used as a bargaining chip, and they did it. They really paid a very low price for uh, the, uh, you know, American uh, Princeton uh, a researcher who, that was set free because he had stood trial and he was convicted of a espionage. But well, if, in the same way, for argument's future, sake, Mr. Khushchev, the same could be said of Mr. Wang, that he didn't do anything wrong, that he was a graduate student, he was involved in research, and that the allegations of espionage were highly exaggerated. I told you, um, he stood trial. That's the difference. He uh, went on trial. He was convicted of espionage. But Dr. Soleimani, he was never uh, he was never given a chance to defend himself in a court of law. He was not co uh, convicted of any kind of uh, you know wrongdoing, right. and he was not a criminal. Uh, that that's the first uh, difference. Um, and he was about to be set free. Um, because they never found anything about him, actually, as the Americans said, next month he would be set free. 
But uh, your your main theme in this program is uh, if uh, this could be, uh, you know, a good omen or uh, something to show us uh, the future deals, wider deals, probably over, uh, you know, the differences in the missile industry, in regional clout, as well as the differences between the two sides over the future of the nuclear deal. No, absolutely not. Not until the United States removes the sanctions and allows Iran to uh, export oil and receive the money back here. These two conditions are okay. very substantial and very serious on the side of Iran. So this is the United States right. that should be the game changer, and they should change the conditions. And that's pretty much what the president of Iran has also said. Uh, Ms. Khrushchev, you've echoed his sentiments exactly. Uh, Mr. Barton, let me just read out exactly what Mr. Rouhani had said. He said, as soon as the United States agrees to put aside its wrong, illegal, unjust, and terrorist-style sanctions, we will have no problem to immediately sit down with the leaders of the P5 plus one groups of countries. Now, in your opinion, Mr. Barton, just what has transpired in terms of this prisoner swap, can that be indicative that maybe finally there is some kind of leeway that is being shown by both parties, that negotiations could be soon uh, coming in the future? Well, thank you very much for having me on, on your show today. Um, I would probably sort of echo what uh, your what Mr. Koscheshem has said as well, that I think really um, it's rather optimistic of the Americans to suggest that this is going to somehow be sort of the door through which they can somehow start talking to the Iranians, because the Iranians have been pretty clear um, about the, the fact that the sanctions is really the key. And if you look at what happened on Friday at the Vienna meeting in which the remaining signature of the of the JCPOA of the Joint uh, Com Comprehensive Comprehensive Plan, um, they came out. Uh, not looking very optimistic, but at least, you know, encouraged by the fact that the agreement isn't yet dead. But I think what we're going to probably see in the next month or so is what happens with the Europeans, whether, whether they will uh, decide to um, take a different position in relation to uh, not triggering any of the mechanisms in the agreement. So I think we've still got another month or so before that, that sort of starts to play out. But I would probably share with, with Mr. Koshesham that this isn't necessarily going to lead to any sort of major breakthrough. Because a lot of what is being said now by analysts is that just this agreement to a prisoner swap is showing Iran's eagerness uh, to settle down this dispute once and for all. It's suffering economically. There are protests. There are reports of over a thousand killed in protests in Iran alone. I mean, it's getting a lot of heat in that way. Uh, do, you in, do you feel that there is some credibility to those claims by analysts? Well, so the Americans have sort of been are looking at what the pro the recent protests in, in in Iran as sort of example of you know maximum pressure is working. Uh, but then on the other hand, you could very well argue that that this is actually not necessarily the case. Uh, when you look at earlier protests, for example, the ones that took place at the beginning of last last year, in the beginning of 2018, uh, we saw uh, divisions opening up within the regime uh, between sort of President Rouhani on one side and Supreme Leader Khatami on the other side. Uh, we haven't seen so much of that in the recent process, and indeed since uh, the, the nuclear climate crisis really started to pick up earlier this year. Uh, the regime looks very much united at the moment, and so it looks very unlikely that there's going to be a, a, a real shift. Mr. Khushashem, I'm sure you're not going to disagree that the regime is very united at this point in time. But let's reflect a little on the Vienna Convention that took place, the conference that took place on Friday. Uh, once again, it seems that the European signatories have not been able to say anything different. I mean, it, or has, in your opinion, something changed this time around? Do they have more weightage behind them and making any difference in the kind of sort of stalled position uh, the JCPOA members have been in for the past year? Uh, let me uh, point out one, one, one uh, crucial point here. Uh, you just mentioned that uh, over a thousand is, have been killed in Iranian protests uh, uh, in the last month. That's wrong. Uh, as a matter of fact, no official numbers have been declared so far. And Amnesty International, which does not have, uh, uh, you know, field agents here, and its numbers cannot be trusted, of course, but still, uh, they have even stressed that uh, they, uh, they, they, they fear somewhere around 163 
uh, are dead. That's uh, the, the only number that's been stated, and that's by Amnesty International that could not be, of course, very much trusted in this respect, uh, as they are absent uh, in this country and they, are, they don't numbers, have any field what numbers would you but, trust? What numbers would you trust? Would you trust the government's given numbers? They have not. They, they have not actually uh, uh, released the number of the dead so far. Uh, what we do know for sure is nine or uh, ten uh, state, uh, uh, you know, of uh, the police, policemen or IRGC members, Basij members from the side of the state have been martyred. But uh, from the other side, the opposite okay. side, we do not know. They right. have not declared oh. it, but they said they would soon declare okay. the number. We don't want to get into... Uh, the I Iranian protests and the number of people killed and, and, and the whole sort of dispute of the authenticity of that. What we're trying to focus on, like you said yourself, is whether this is going to lead to a way forward. I mean, let's also talk about, like, get your comments on whether the European signatories have finally made a move that could get more weightage or more pressure on Trump to get back on the negotiating table. No, as far as the Europeans are concerned, uh, we have not seen any kind of positive move, uh, despite the fact that six uh, uh, European states have joined the INSTEX. INSTEX, first of all, is not in operation because uh, they have found no bank to do the transactions uh, and it's not working. And even if it's working, that's not going to provide Iran with even 1% of what has been promised under the nuclear deal. So we do not see any practical move by the European sides to try to keep uh, you know, the JCPOA alive. They have, uh, on the contrary, they have picked up a threatening tone, warning that they would trigger the snap back uh, and uh, the, the, you know, uh, they, they would snap back the resolutions, the UN resolutions against Iran. And uh, uh, I don't think that Iran would be deterred by such threats, uh, first of all. But there are some other signs that could be seen uh, in the last one or two months that Americans might be willing to uh, present uh, new offers in the next couple of months. That wouldn't be a very major move, but uh, because, uh, you know, the sanctions, as I've stated uh, earlier in, on your show, uh, they have a peak when it comes to uh, the maximum efficiency of the sanctions. There is a period and there is a peak. The peak was somewhere in summer, uh, maximum by September, and uh, the sanctions have already failed to, uh, uh, you know, uh, achieve their goal. The goal is pushing Tehran to the negotiating table, and they have failed. So now the United States is doing two things. One. It is trying to use other areas of soft warfare as well as semi-hard warfare, that's economy, various types of foreign currency meddling, spionage, economic espionage, and, uh, and, and using media and many other fields in order to uh, threaten Tehran more and more and increase the pressures right. on Tehran. At the same okay. time, at the end of this period, uh, we do believe that somewhere around uh, Christmas, I mean, uh, the new year, Christian year, uh, Americans might start, uh, uh, you know, giving Tehran offers for, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, exporting somewhere around half a million to one million uh, uh, crude uh, barrels in return for opening up negotiations. Anyway, what I said earlier, I do insist on that. As long as the United States keeps the pressure and keeps the sanctions in place and refrains from removing the sanctions, uh, right. There won't be any chance there for won't any be any negotiation. I remember, remember the conversation we had on Newswire about you giving us a timeline of how you see this moving forward. And you did talk about how the sanctions would fail and Trump would reel back the pressure around this time of the year. But at the same time, what we're seeing uh, from Iran, and I, I want to move forward from the protests, that in itself is indicative, uh, not just the economy and the numbers, of the kind of turmoil Iran is facing as a result of these sanctions. But we also saw the Deputy Foreign Minister Abbas Arakchi, he went out and reached out to Shinzo Abe, the Japanese um, uh, uh, Prime Minister, and it, with a written message from President Rouhani. I mean, th that of course uh, seems like him trying to get other parties on board to, you know, finish off this deadlock.
Well, uh, uh, what I'm telling you, telling you is that maybe, I do not know, uh, maybe there have been some back channel messages from uh, the other side, from the opposite side, uh, right. through the Japanese or through other mediators. Uh, and maybe uh, Tehran uh, has already, of course, provided them with the definite answer that it won't go to the talks without the removal of the sanctions. But maybe some details have changed and uh, uh, probably uh, what I'm telling you, uh, okay. I was telling you about uh, the new offer. That might be the case. Uh, and Americans might have uh, you know, offered some new terms, probably. Or right. maybe the mediators, the French as well as the Japanese, have raised mm -hmm. new offers. Okay, so those offers turn out, we'll find out in, uh, in, in the coming days. Now, Mr. Burton, let's also get your comment on how Europe plans to move forward with this, because if these snapback sanctions uh, that it seemed to have been sort of threatening Iran with, whatever you, way you want to interpret it, at the same time, could, could the Europeans even afford to cross that, what the, the Iranians say, the red line of, um, you know, going... Uh, in imposing these sanctions, could they risk losing Iran or losing the JCPOA? Because it does provide them the kind of regional security they badly need at this point. Yes, and uh, I would I would say that one of the big challenges for the Europeans, uh, as uh, I mean, just leading on from what Mr. Kochevsky said a little bit earlier, um, you know, one of the big problems with the INSTEX, the sort of the instrument that the Europeans set up, is that as well as being sort of problematic, is it doesn't really cover enough of the um, you know the goods and services that that Iran's, Iran's really need. Um, you know, the sanctions are effectively you know cut a big hole into the Iranian economy, and so the the Iranians really need to see movement from the Europeans uh, in that respect for it for them to consider that there's going to be any kind of major shift. Um, there also, there's also been sort of some talk about, you know, the Iranians wanting the, the Europeans to sort of not just you know, make make that make the instrument work, but also some form of aid as well to help with uh, sort of co as a form of compensation. Um, but it's interesting. I mean, you you were just talking about sort of other actors as well, and I think what's interesting is that we focus an awful lot on the on the E3. You know, Britain, France, and Germany who are part of this this. Uh, this group of, of signatories, but there's also the Russians and the Chinese, and we haven't really been speaking a lot about them and what they propose to do uh, to support the the deal and to keep the agreement in, in running. Um, the Chinese themselves have, you know broadly made general statements that, you know, they would like to see the agreement kept alive, uh, but they've not really been sort of talking about increasing their investment or increasing trade or providing any kind of sort of aid package to the Chinese, to, to, the, to the Iranians. And so I think that would be a really interesting area to, to explore a little bit. I mean, but the trade on oil with the Chinese and Iran, that has been going on off the books. It's been going on with India. I mean, they, they'll deny it, but from what we are seeing from reports, it seems that that is an ongoing. But coming back to the instex, it seems like by some, uh, inter from some analysts, the way it's been interpreted, we've talked about it a lot on Newswire, it seems like it's a pretty much not a solution because until or unless the U.S. steps back on the sanctions and the maximum pressure strategy, there's really not much any party can do. And I wonder then whether China or Russia's role, however discreet, could make any difference to the situation, Mr. Burton? Yeah. I mean, one of the big problems, of course, with the Instex and with the European side is that uh, Instex is really there to help European companies, of which most of them are private companies. And so they are also somewhat wary about getting involved in, 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 a, in a system which may result in them facing sanctions from the United States. Um, so without the Europeans being able to uh, reassure those companies, they're going to be very unwilling to take part, take part in it. Uh, I think the big difference with, say, Russian and Chinese companies is you have a, a number of you know, significant state-owned enterprises there. And if they felt confident that their government was going to back them, as well as the fact that these companies potentially are less exposed to the international financial markets, that potentially could be a way forward. And then there's also concern now, Mr. Khrushchev, with the latest that there are long-range ballistic missiles that have been stashed away in Iraq, intelligence reports coming out one after the other, saying that the Iranians are preparing for in case that they do get attacked, that they have other places to move forward from uh, or to launch an attack from. Those reports, as controversial as they are, they really put a damper on any kind of progress that could be made between the two. 
since 2017, the United States has been, uh, you know, stressing, even this has been stressed in Pentagon budget bill, that the U.S. does not want to see Iran have a road from Tehran to, uh, you know, uh, uh, western Syria through southwestern Iraq at Tanf, at al Kamal uh, passageway. And uh, uh, they have been doing, uh, you know, moving heaven and earth in order to cut off Tehran's access to this, you know, what they call the Mediterranean cor corridor. And uh, they have been warning uh, the government in Baghdad uh, to, uh, you know, stop Tehran and to, uh, you know, uh, to never open up this TANF passageway. And when Adel Abdul Mahdi in Iraq did so, I mean, he opened up the, uh, the border crossing, uh, they bombed it, the Americans bombed it, and they warned him that there would be repercussions for him. And then demonstrations that were, uh, you know, they were uh, the legitimate concerns of the people who were worried about the lack of service as well as corruption and, you know, so many problems that they have. They were hijacked by the Americans uh, 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 the, who intensified the situation and escalated the tensions into uh, riots. That's what they did in Iran as well. That's what the U.S. do. They are trying to escalate the situation in Iraq in order to push the country into turmoil and blame Iran in order to uh, slow down Iran's influence and, you know, uh, start smear campaign against Iran to push Iran back uh, and away from Iraq, from Syria and from Lebanon. That's the plan they have right. had for quite a long time in order to wear off Iran's influence in the region. Well, you know, it, I at your point of view, but at the same time, with the leaked Iran cables, it becomes really hard to believe that that could be a plan, that even if it is, it, it, it will go ahead with the kind of security and intelligence presence that Iran has in Iraq. Well, um, what, what, what matters in there is that the U.S. troops have sharply increased in Iraq, despite the uh, you know numbers that have been going down in Syria. Uh, they have been increasing the number of uh, the U.S. troops in Iraq. They have been bombing the Hashd al-Shabi or the uh, mobilized forces, as well as their uh, you know stockpile uh, weapons stockpiles in there. They have ru been running smear campaign against Iran and all those groups in Iraq that are an ally of Iran. And they have been running a smear campaign uh, on social media, on Twitter, okay. Facebook, everywhere against Iran. Iran was not the point in Iraq's popular protest. But okay. after several months, you could see that they are portraying a condition, I mean, a, a, a picture of Iraq where uh, a foreigners would think that Iran is really one of the matters, while it's okay. not. They All want right. to, we get uh, your point. you know, Mr. Khosh Sashin, we're running out of, I'm sorry to interrupt you there. Mr. Burton, is it even realistic then to expect with the kind of conditions that have been given out by both parties, by the U.S., by Iran. Iran wants the sanctions to be rolled back. The U.S. wants them to come and play fair. They have a list of allegations from their presence in the Middle East as proxy wars, uh, uh, supporting proxy wars. The big challenge, the big problem which uh, we face is that effectively the Iranians and the Americans want two separate things. Um, as you've pointed out in your question, on the one hand, you know, the Iranians want the Americans to go back to, to, to go back to the to the agreement they already had. But that's really only limited to dealing with the nuclear program itself. The Americans, on the other hand, uh, well, basically Trump and, and people around him feel that the, the agreement wasn't enough, that really they wanted to sort of tackle Iran's relationship in the wider region. So they, their attempt is to try and push them through sanctions to the negotiation table where the nuclear program will be bound up with Iran's role in Lebanon, Yemen and other places. And it's very hard to see how those two can sort of be squared. Um, I suppose, you know, if, if there's going to be any kind of discussion or talk about sort of Iranian uh, foreign policy more widely, it's got to go through, you know, go through the, the, the agreements and through the nu nuclear program arrangements right. that they already had. It's going to be very hard to see them be able to do that. The biggest contention that President had was that it didn't incl include the JCPOA, the, the, the factor about the missiles. And now with the reports on short-range missiles being found in Iraq by Iran, I mean, it's, a, it's really essentially a threat to U.S.'s allies in the region that is doing the talking, that is imposing the maximum pressure on Iran.
And I would say, I mean, I mean, having just come back from the Med Dialogues in, in Rome, where there are a number of sort of, you know, government officials from the region, as well as from you know, the United States, it was very striking how, and notable, you know, how firm the American officials were when they were talking about Iran. And certainly they have this view that, you know, they want Iran to be a, quote, you know, normal country and to, quote, behave responsibly. Um, and so for them, that means going further than just uh, going back to the table and, and talking about the nuclear program. They want to talk about everything. But as far as the Iranians are concerned for the moment, it's primarily about just getting back to the agreement they already had. Right. Mr. Guy Burden, Mr. Mustafa Khushtashim, thank you so much for joining us here on News 5. We'll take a quick short break. And when we are back, we will be talking to our experts to shed some light on whether the U.S. Taliban talks are finally taking off. Welcome back to Newswire with me, Aiza Umar. Now, peace talks have resumed between the U.S. and the Taliban. Monday marks the third day of talks that are taking place between high-level Taliban leaders in Doha with a U.S. special envoy to Afghanistan, Mr. Zalme Khalilzad, leading the U.S. team. Now, tax talks, as you'll recall, came to an abrupt end in September after almost a year of negotiations between the two parties. President Donald Trump called them off for reasons that remain largely disputed and, like the U.S. foreign policy in the region, pretty much incoherent. Now, at the time, President Trump showed outrage at the killing of a U.S. soldier in a suicide bombing in Kabul and cancelled the talks that were expected to resume in Camp David, the country retreat of the U.S. president, which is strange in itself because 15 more American servicemen had already been killed leading up to those fateful Camp David talks. In fact, a week after President Trump cancelled the entire thing, the Taliban ramped up attacks ahead of the Afghan presidential elections, and as a result, an American special forces soldier was killed while fighting alongside Afghan commandos in the Vardak province. Bringing the number of American service members to die during combat operation this year alone to 17, that is the highest number since 2014. Now, the focus of the talks are to be uh, the end of violence, a ceasefire by both sides, and all of this will hopefully lead to intra afghan dialogue. Now, with the government, uh, the, the Taliban still calls the U.S. Pu puppet. What exactly has changed? What can we expect? And all of this and more we will be discussing with our guests who are joining us. Let me introduce Mr. Mushtaq, an analyst joining us from Kabul today, and Mr. Hamdullah Hamdard, an analyst also joining us from Kabul. Welcome to both of you to Newswire. Uh, Mr. Rahim, let's start with you with this latest development and especially keeping in mind that the presidential election recount is at a standstill or still in process. It's hard to really understand. How do you see the development of these talks? Is this a new chapter forward for uh, the peace in the region? Well, of course, um, uh, the abrupt uh, cancellation of the peace process was a concern among all the uh, all those who were following the issues and who wanted to see a peaceful settlement of the ongoing conflict. Uh, so this is a good development. The expectations were there that it, that the peace talks will uh, resume, um, um, of course, and uh, I think this is a big uh, move forward. Uh, the, the, the talks have begun, and uh, the discussions about uh, 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 reaching a ceasefire and starting the uh, intra afghan negotiation. Uh, I think uh, all these things are quite uh, helpful in terms of uh, uh, finding a peaceful solution to the Afghan conflict. And uh, I won't call it a new chapter, but of course, a good move forward. It's, it's the same um, process that was halted and it's resumed. Um, so, so it's quite good that uh, we have the peace process once again and mm. people are sitting across the table to each other and talking about the uh, solution of the conflict. So you see it as a good way forward here, not a new chapter like you said, but a good way forward. Uh, Mr. Hamdard, let's get your opinion on this because at the same time, let's not forget the main stalling points from last time war that the Taliban said that the foreign forces need to withdraw. Something that the U.S. seems to, as we understand from President Trump's constant mantra of bring the boys home, bring the boys home, that they are ready to withdraw and focus on the mess that he has to face in the U.S. itself, the impeachment process, what on, so forth. But at the same time, 
There are reports confirmed by the Secretary of Defense, Jim Mattis, that uh, this was from earlier in September. 3,500 more U.S. troops are being sent to Afghanistan. With those kind of conditions, it just seems to be the same old story on repeat. I, be I believe that uh, uh, definitely Taliban have uh, discussed the withdrawal of the U.S. forces and in other international forces or the NATO forces from Afghanistan. And at the same time, the NATO is also uh, considering that if they withdraw the forces without getting or receiving any guarantee from the Taliban to finish the hostilities in the country and to stop the hostilities in the country and also to go for the ceasefire with the Afghan uh, army, uh, without such a guarantee or security, uh, they are also not going to reduce their military leverage, the, the same as Taliban are not going to do the ceasefire because they believe that their military le leverage will be reduced. Right. Uh, here is the problem. We also see the NATO or the American forces that the number have increased. So, uh, so far, we do not know what they have been discussing with each other. However, Shahil, uh, Suhail Shaheen has said that uh, in the, uh, yesterday's meeting, they have discussed the uh, signing of the deal where they would like to sign this deal and how and uh, who should be present there what, what, uh, and so uh, uh, and such uh, topics like that. But still, we are not sure whether the U.S. will agree uh, with the Taliban to withdraw the U.S. forces from Afghanistan or not. However, they have discussed the phased withdrawal of the U.S. troops from Afghanistan. And at the same time, whatever is very important, and we uh, or people in Afghanistan are hopeful for that, that is to successfully end this uh, uh, stage uh, of the U.S. and Taliban peace talks uh, on the Afghan peace. Uh, then they are looking forward to uh, starting or beginning of the uh, intra-Afghan peace talks between the Afghan Taliban and the Afghan government. Mm. Uh, we look forward to that, and hopefully this relaunch of the peace talks by Zalmi Khalidzad with the Taliban will be successful. People here in Afghanistan are very happy for that, that it right. has restarted, and uh, uh, they are all looking for a positive result of these talks. OK, but Mr. Rahim, how do you see it at the same time while they're all sitting together in Doha trying to negotiate on the old terms and conditions, trying to sign a peace deal which abruptly stopped just a few months ago at the whim of the U.S. president? Here we are getting reports. Of course, these need to be more substantiated from our sources. What we've learned is that 25 Taliban were killed in an ambush by uh, in different operations in Zabul and Uruzgan provinces. How does this unfold in a positive way? Uh, there has not been any agreement on uh, cessation of hostilities. Uh, they have not reached a ceasefire. Uh, both sides uh, have been talking about reducing the level of violence, which is also not uh, at least formally announced to be implemented as an agreement. Uh, so the, con the, the violence and confrontations continue. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't see it as a unique thing happening in Afghanistan. We have the similar experience in Colombia where the parties agreed to continue their battlefield confrontations, but that, sh that with an agreement that it won't affect their peace negotiations. So uh, until we have a complete halt in military operations from all sides, based on a agreed uh, ceasefire uh, uh, agreement, I don't think it will stop. Uh, but as long as the understanding is that we will continue talking and per continue pursuing the peace agenda, uh, these sort of, uh, uh, what do you call it, losses will not have big impact. Now, some people may ask the question that after killing of one American serviceman in Kabul, uh, the whole peace process was halted by President Trump. How can one see this as not affecting the whole process? We'll come back to that very important point you're making. And just on the same sort of note there, Mr. Hamdad, why is it that right now the Taliban and the U.S. officials sitting down 
uh, include members uh, from the Taliban who have just been exchanged uh, for uh, the, uh, they include Mr. Anas Haqqani, who, who is one of the three senior Taliban members who were freed in exchange of the Kidnap American University and Australian professors uh, that uh, just took place last month. And why is it that there is so much leeway and compromise and understanding when it comes to the Taliban in the U.S. between each other. But when it comes to the government, the Afghan government, they just will not budge with their demand that they will not speak to the Afghan government as they see it as a U.S. puppet. Uh, well, uh, exactly. There is nothing about being the U.S. puppet or something like that. But the Taliban want to gain more during these peace talks with the U.S. And that's why they are insisting on talking with the U.S. and not talking with the Afghan government during the intra-Afghan uh, peace negotiations. Uh, the, the, the other part of your question, that why Anas Haqqani was also part of, or why he is part of the delegation of the Taliban, uh, talking to Zalmay Khalilzad, uh, who is the peace and reconciliation uh, representative of the U.S. Uh, for the Afghan peace. Uh, I guess that Haqqani network has been uh, playing a very key role in the Taliban attacks, and they are planning and arranging uh, the attacks. Uh, they are playing the key role there, uh, and even uh, Haqqani is also uh, uh, the deputy of uh, Mullah Haibatullah. Uh, so they definitely want uh, a key member of themselves, uh, Anas Haqqani, their brother, uh, mm -hmm. to play uh, a role in this peace talks with the U.S. Uh, why they are still insisting not uh, talking with the Afghan government, I guess that they want to uh, ensure a chaos inside Afghanistan, uh, and they do not want, I mean, Taliban do not want the Afghan government to be able to make a group or a delegation to talk with the Taliban. Most of the times, Taliban are insisting on political parties, on some groups or elites in Afghanistan. Right. They say that they are ready to talk to them, but not ready to talk to the Afghan government, which mm -hmm. is kind of, uh, you know, uh, disturbing this uh, uh, It is process. very disturbing. They it's very disturbing because they're uh, uh, sidelining deliberately the one party that was democratically representing the Afghan people. Mr. Rahim, coming back to the point you were making here, it took one serviceman's death to throw out an entire year's worth of work on bringing some kind of agreement between these two, the U.S. and the Taliban. And here, in just in the recent incident, just the last one in the past 24 hours, 25 Taliban killed. How does that work? I said early, earlier, uh, as I said earlier, uh, uh, until there is a complete agreement on the ceasefire, the battlefield skirmishes will continue. Uh, they have been talking about reduction of violence, which means that they will be talking, but there will be some sort of confrontations. No, I get uh, that. I get that. That is pretty much the sort of protocol that is followed in these kind of conflict zones. This is the kind of weight they use in pushing and pressurizing. But let's not forget that even in these talks, in these current round of talks, there are five senior Taliban officials who were released from Guantanamo Bay after 13 years of being sentenced. These were prisoners in the U.S. prison in exchange for one U.S. Army officer. So what I'm trying to highlight here is that again and again, the U.S. has pandered to the Taliban request, whether for exchange of uh, the Taliban prisoners being returned or, or one thing or the other. How is it that they have not once stood their ground on involving the Afghan government in these critical talks as a way forward? Well, yes, that's something that we have been quest questioning, uh, that uh, the Taliban have been trying to uh, avoid the Afghan government. And uh, to my understanding, that mainly is that they want to create a situation where the Afghan government has very little leverage in the whole process. Uh, I have, have not been able to really bring in the Afghan, uh, uh, the Afghan side into the talks. Uh, and that's quite questionable. And I think that's the loophole in the whole process. Uh, which, I, which I have highlighted time and again, because until we have the, this side of the conflict, this, this particular party, which is the uh, Afghan government and the Afghan political elite that, is, uh, that have been part of the, uh, the governance process in the country for the last 18 years, uh, this, thing, uh, this whole uh, peace process may not succeed. Uh, and I agree with you that, that that's questionable. Uh, but I think the Taliban and the American have been more concerned about agreeing on uh, the main demand of the Taliban because they have been fighting on the agenda. They have been able to mobilize uh, their food soldiers on the only point that is 
uh, uh, making Americans withdraw from the Af- uh, from the Afghan territory, and the Taliban went to earn that leverage in order to maintain the loyalties of the uh, fighters on the ground, because until and unless they they, uh, they they don't achieve that, there is a worry of disintegration among their ranks on the ground, and they don't want to see that before achieving the, uh, their wider goals on the negotiation table. So, uh, to me, the Taliban must have some sort of... Uh, some sort of understanding with the Americans that they will be definitely talking to the Afghan uh, government and rest of the political elite once they have satisfied uh, the leadership that they have achieved the ultimate goal, uh, mm. at least on the uh, face of a piece of paper. Uh, but I can tell you that there is an understanding that without engagement with uh, with, with uh, Afghan government and without con- uh, conduct of intra-Afghan negotiation, this peace process is not going to work, and mm-hmm. if anybody is uh, thinking that by an agreement between the Americans and the Taliban, uh, they'll be able to achieve peace, I don't think that's going to happen. All right, it's not going to happen unless the Afghan government is part of these conversations. Mr. Hamdullah Hamdard and Mr. Mushtaq Rahim, thank you so much for taking out the time speaking to us here on Newswire. It's time for us to go. We will be seeing you tomorrow for the new episode, more analysis on the happenings around the world. Till then, goodbye.